This is a CBS News special report. Here is CBS News correspondent Harry Reasoner. Good evening. The body of Senator Robert Kennedy is now in the air in a jet furnished by the White House and the Air Force heading for New York from Los Angeles. It left there a little bit before 4.30 New York time this afternoon. It will land at LaGuardia Airport in New York. The body will be brought to St. Patrick's Cathedral, arriving sometime around 9.30 New York time tonight. Tomorrow from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. and longer if there are lines there. It will lie in state before a requiem mass at 10 a.m. Saturday, then to go by train from New York to Washington and in a motor procession from New York's Union Station to go by the Senate office building and by the Justice Department where Robert Kennedy served as Attorney General before burial at about 5.30 Saturday afternoon in the same plot where President John Kennedy lies. Already there are people gathering by St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York waiting for the arrival of the casket tonight. There is CBS News correspondent Charles Corral. St. Patrick's has uh, been the scene of the funeral of a great many public figures. And on Saturday, it's to be the scene of the High Requiem Mass for Senator Kennedy. The motor procession that is to bring the body of Senator Kennedy here isn't expected for another two hours. But already, there must be a 1,000 or 2,000 people gathered on Fifth Avenue in front of uh, stores which have the picture of Senator Kennedy in them. His body will arrive here uh, in about two hours and uh, will be met by Terence Cook, the new Archbishop of New York. And then tomorrow, all these people who are waiting here to pay their last respects to Senator Kennedy in the state from which he was elected to the Senate will um, have a chance to view his body. The body of the senator will lie in state at uh, St. Patrick's all day tomorrow before the High Requiem Mass on Saturday morning. Charles Kuralt, CBS News, at St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue, New York. We will be there when the uh, plane lands at LaGuardia and proceeds into St. Patrick's Cathedral tonight. In the meantime, we would like at this time to present a report on the life and career of Senator Robert Kennedy with CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. These last few weeks, Robert Francis Kennedy was enjoying himself. There was a good fight to fight, and he was a fighter. Ideals were at stake, and he was an idealist. And for a man whose demeanor always seemed to suggest a boyish kind of shyness, he really enjoyed getting out among the people. He enjoyed the physical contact. He refused police protection because he said that all the people wanted to do was to touch him, not to hurt him. He made a point of that. He knew that the people didn't want to hurt him. And he plunged into areas that even local mayors steer clear of, and he was manhandled. Something seemed to grow in the shy third brother of a dynamic family in these weeks of primary campaigning. The younger brother, who had stayed behind the scenes and come into his own, especially in the wild final week in California. Tuesday night was a particularly joyous night. Robert Francis Kennedy was 42 years old and had just won the victory of his political life in the California presidential primary. He spoke to his supporters, heard their cheers, and invited them to Chicago. Senator Kennedy was a very happy man as he made his way out of the crowd into the hotel kitchen into the range of a young, swarthy assailant. The senator was hit by two bullets. Five other persons were also wounded as bullets sprayed the kitchen. Only the senator was critically hurt. Police later identified the alleged assailant as 24-year-old Siran Siran, a native Jordanian who came to this country 11 years ago. Siran's brother Adele is said to have given the name to police. Fingerprints later confirmed that identification. Among the things discovered in a search of Siran's personal effects, was a newspaper clipping criticizing Senator Kennedy's support of United States aid to Israel and a notebook with scribbled lines saying Kennedy must be killed before June 5th. The suspect himself reportedly has refused to talk with police. He would not even tell them his name. Robert Kennedy was shot at 12.15 p.m. Pacific Coast time. 
the end of a brilliant political and public career. At the age of 42, Robert Francis Kennedy is dead. All right, welcome back. And this is part of my video series. We're going to be covering the RFK assassination. And um, on this channel, we usually cover the JFK assassination, but RFK was JFK's brother, and he was part of the anti-establishment uh, I guess you could say thing that was going on back in the 60s his death coming two months after Martin Luther King shows you the desperation of the right wing establishment that was trying to continue the war in Vietnam, continue massive military buildup and profits across the world, to hold back the rights of various minority groups, and to maintain power inside the American government and to take on, destroy, surveil, murder anyone that challenged their threat to ultimate, their reign to ultimate power in the United States. And with the assassination of RFK, you saw the Democratic Party completely fall apart. It splintered. And then after 72, what was the right-wing part of the Democratic Party completely shifted um, to the Republican Party. And what was part of the liberal side of the Republican Party completely shifted to the Democratic Party. And this polarization goes all the way up to today, where we find ourselves. But um, it was very clear at least now, that Sirhan, <clears throat> like James Earl Ray, like um, Lee Oswald, was manipulated into position where he could be framed for the killing of uh, RFK. There, we're going to go over all the evidence. There's numerous, numerous um, witnesses that saw a security guard to the right of RFK and once Sirhan Sirhan started speaking the security guard pulled his weapon and shot Kennedy in the back of the head we're gonna go over the coroner's report that shows where Kennedy was shot in the back of the head on the right back of the head no further than two inches away that means the muzzle blast was no more than two inches away from RFK's head and if you look at the we're gonna go over this you look at the positions of everyone in the pantry Sirhan Sirhan was a good five feet away being held by Rosie Greer on the pantry table and RFK was facing him. So there was no way that Sirhan Sirhan could have shot Kennedy in the back of the head two inches away on the opposite side. There are also the, the type of weapon that um, Sirhan was using was a 22 caliber 8 shot. I believe it was an Iverson revolver. Interesting interesting note is that uh, the guy who tried to shoot um, Ronald Reagan was also shooting an, an eight shot revolver but when they went in and started pulling bullets and counting 
bodies that had bullets in it, they came up with about 10 to 12 bullets. So there's no way that one guy firing from a pantry with eight shot Iverson could have shot 10 to 12 bullets at the people because there were five or six people injured. Kennedy took three or four shots himself. Some people were hit multiple times. So the bullets just don't add up. And then right after the trial, the panels where the bullets hit that didn't go in the bodies were destroyed by the Los Angeles Police Department. There was also the incident of um, the young Hispanic woman that was sitting on the stairwell outside of the um, Ambassador Hotel and she said that there was a woman that came out a blonde woman with a polka dotted dress with two other males came running down the stairs saying we shot him we shot him and she said well who, who, who did you shoot and she said, Robert Kennedy, we shot him. Uh, and then this woman ran off. There was no, also a report by a policeman, as he was a detective, as he was entering the Ambassador Hotel, an elderly couple were coming out, and they gave him a report that they had seen a woman, a, 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 woman, a blonde woman in a yellow polka dotted dress that said that they had shot Kennedy. There was also the um, testimony of another black man who said he saw the same woman and she said the same thing. There's numerous people that saw Sirhan Sirhan with this blonde woman in the polka dotted dress and going around the ballroom there. Even Sirhan Sirhan's own testimony, he says that all he remembers, he doesn't remember the shooting, all he remembers is he was looking for some coffee and he found a coffee maker that was bright and silver and shining and standing next to that was a blonde woman in a polka dotted dress and then after that all he remembers is being choked and waking up in the pantry he doesn't remember anything that happened after that now I'm not a big fan or believer in um, hypnosis and using hypnosis as mind control to get people to do what you want but the military the CIA did spend millions of dollars and years of testing and years of uh, experimenting on using mind control LSD and all these things and all I know is that most people, most government agencies, most businesses won't spend money on something unless they believe it'll work. So, regardless of that, there's also the case of this woman that I talked about sitting on the stairs, and she says she saw the Hispanic woman, she sits on the stairs and she sees a, the blonde woman with the polka dot dress come out and said they shot him, they shot him. There's this curious scenario incident where she's interrogated by a former policeman or a policeman in the Los Angeles Police Department who later on would go on to Vietnam and be an advisor for the CIA. But he spends an incredible amount of time trying to convince her that she's lying or she didn't hear what she heard and he spends hours wearing her down 
and telling her about the legal consequences of lying and all this kinds of stuff, where she finally gives up and just tells him what he wants to hear and even signs a statement to that effect. So why would a policeman waste taxpayer money and time and hours trying to convince this one woman that she didn't see what she saw? There's also the curious case that over a year before that Sirhan Sirhan had been a jockey at a racetrack owned by a prominently known mob figure who just happened to have be good friends with J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover would come to his resort and stay for free. Matter of fact, I believe during the JFK assassination, that's where Hoover was spending his time for about a week while right after the JFK assassination, the JFK assassination, and did all of his phone calls from this resort of this mob mob guy in Orange County, I believe, in Cerritos, I believe that's where it's at. We're going to get into that. But another interesting thing is that Sirhan Sirhan had um, been this jockey and horse person, and he had either fallen or been kicked off the horse or thrown from the horse and had a brain injury and was going to, um, you know, he was going to therapy on that and going to a hypnotherapist to deal with the pain. The same hypnotherapist was part of this CIA program, or later found out, and he had confessed to a couple of women that he knew that he was had programmed Sirhan Sirhan to shoot Robert Kennedy. Another interesting thing is that Sirhan Sirhan, who lived in Pasadena, was involved in this group called the Rosicrucians. And, you know, they used a lot of alternative types of healing, mind control, um, things like that. I don't know a lot about them, but I found that interesting. That, that was out of Pasadena there. When his mother, Sirhan Sirhan's mother, came and visited him in jail, she asked him, why did you shoot our, um, Robert Kennedy? She goes, I, I, don't, I don't know why. They say I shot Robert Kennedy. I don't remember doing it. I don't remember shooting him, okay? And then there's the curious case where while in jail awaiting the trial that Sirhan Sirhan was taken through a bunch of regression therapy with hypnosis to try to remember him shooting Robert Kennedy. If you listen to the recordings, which we will, it almost sounds like they're trying to program Sirhan Sirhan or convince him that he did it instead of trying to help him remember if he did it. Um, there was one other thing here about Robert Kennedy. Oh, I believe it was David Atlee Phillips who was, I've gone over my other tapes, that was involved in the assassination and and moving Oswald around of the of JFK was spotted in a video inside the Ambassador Hotel in the lobby with a couple of other guys with him there. There was something about his watch that he was wearing that distinguished him. It was a specific, a specific type of either a German or Swiss watch that only Phillips wore, there weren't that many of them in the United States, and only David Atlee Phillips wore that I remember going over about, about the watch there. Um, of course, Robert Kennedy didn't help himself. He didn't have a lot of police protection. And this guy, that security guard, who's accused of being the second gunman, he had 
exactly the same type of revolver that Sirhan used, but he used a different type of weapon. And uh, this security guard, they did an interview of him, and he was definitely, definitely very racist. Uh, he hated blacks. He hated the civil rights movement. He was involved. I think he helped out with, what was it, McGovern or something like that campaign before McGovern got shot. Um, he, interestingly, went ended up right after that coming into a bunch of money and moving to the Philippines and lived in the Philippines until the day he died. Robert Kennedy um, sent his son, Robert, Robert Kennedy Jr., sent his son, so that would be the grandson of Robert Kennedy, to the Philippines to talk to him. And the guy said he would tell him all he knew and he would confess for something like $100,000 or something like that. Um, the weapon that he used mysteriously disappeared. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, and then Noguchi, who came out with the report, Noguchi is the um, coroner. And he came out with a report that Kennedy was shot from behind the the right ear, two inches, was suspended, and they tried to fire him because they said that his he was incompetent by saying that Kennedy was shot from behind the ear, two inches, when everybody knows that Sirhan Sirhan shot him, which that's not how you do science. In science, you go with what the science tells you, and then you let your, you know, the story revolve around the science, but here we have the district attorney trying to make the science match his story, okay? But yet, in the trial of Sirhan Sirhan, they use, they tried to use the same coroner's report that they were trying to get rid of, Noguchi, saying that Sirhan Sirhan shot Kennedy. And it's interesting that Noguchi was found competent and reinstated to his position. He would later go on, and you'd see the same thing occur in the OJ trial, uh, what about 20-something years later, something like that, how they said he was incompetent and uh, lost the trial against OJ. Um, Sirhan Sirhan, if I remember correctly, Sirhan Sirhan... Um, either didn't go to trial or he confessed. I'll have to read more about this, but I'm, I'm not sure if I'm mixing up the James Earl Ray trial or not, but he might have been convicted. I'm not sure. Well, we're going to read about it. Now, recently, in the last year or so, two years, Sirhan came up for parole and um, was actually found he was actually found eligible for parole. He'd been a model prisoner, never break, breaking the rules, and I believe he's in his 60s or 70s now. And the parole board granted him parole, okay? Which is astounding. Um, he would have gotten out of jail at 70-something years old, but Governor Newsom rejected the parole and ordered Sirhan to stay in prison. So that's quite interesting, I think. Um, but anyway, so we're going to continue and we're doing kind of the same thing. We're going to go over uh, Wikipedia articles. We're going to go over YouTube and other types of video. We're going to go over news articles. And we're also going to go over Mary Farrell documents that I come across. So we're going to cover all the spectrum and see what we can find and dig up on this. There's a lot that um, I've come across, but, you know, we're limited in time and what we can do. But anyway, we're going to get into a little bit of this right now. All right, so the assassination of Robert Kennedy on June 5th 
1968, Robert F. Kennedy was shot by Sirhan Sirhan at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California, and pronounced dead the following day. Kennedy, a United States Senator and candidate in the 1968 Democratic presidential primaries, won the California and South Dakota primaries on June 4th. He addressed his campaign supporters in the Ambassador Hotel's Embassy Ballroom after leaving the podium and exiting through a kitchen hallway. He was mortally wounded by multiple shots fired by Sirhan. Kennedy died at Good Samaritan Hospital nearly 25 hours later. His body was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Now, if you remember what happened, 1968, very tumultuous year. So basically, at the beginning of the year, around February, the Tet Offensive began. That went on for about a month or more and caused a lot of chaos in uh, Vietnam. It basically blew apart the, um, uh, the scenario that Johnson and the other Warhawks had been presenting is that the war was nearly over, the communists were nearly beat, victory was right around the corner, it was just winding down now. And so when the Viet Cong and the Vietnamese launched the Tet Offensive, every city in Vietnam was a battleground. Now the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army decisively lost the, the battle but it didn't matter. When the public looked at that, people that were teetering on the fence that were against the war but not coming out openly, openly started coming out against the war because before, the anti-war movement had mostly been pacifists, Martin Luther King's group, um, and students. Now, we started to see mainstream people, housewives, businessmen, march against the war, okay? Especially because there were people being drafted that were poor. Uh, a lot of college students were getting out of the war, so they saw the sense of guilt, so they went out and protested the war. So Kennedy, basically you could say Kennedy's goals were threefold. To end the war in Vietnam, which went head-to-head -head against the right-wing Warhawk establishment that was going on and that was making massive amounts of money and profits from the war. And you can throw in that uh, the anti-communist um, leftovers from the Cold War. Also was to have some kind of detente with uh, the Soviet Union, reach an understanding with the Soviet Union that, look, as long as you stay in your areas, we'll stay in our areas. We won't go into any crazy, more crazy adventures like the Bay of Pigs or Chile and Allende, all these things. So basically, it was just going to establish a status quo for the world. And another one of Kennedy's Robert Kennedy's probably goals, if he became president, would be to explore the and to find the real assassins behind his brother. And as president, he would have the power to do that. So the right wing establishment, and again, it's this same group that's involved in the assassination of JFK. It's the same group that's involved in the assassination of MLK. So, although with MLK and with RFK, it's more of the, I'd say, the mainstream um, conservative, anti-communist war hawks in the military, in the CIA, and in um, the FBI. There was no love between... RFK and Hoover, they actually hated each other. And when RFK was the Attorney General, which is under the um, Department of Justice, the FBI was under the Department of Justice, although it was an independent agency, 
it still had to take its orders from RFK, so there was not a lot of love there. Okay? Matter of fact, there was not a lo lot of love between Johnson. So, what happened is the Tet Offensive occurred. It pushed the people in the middle to either right or left, making them more extreme, less of a middle ground. The right wing decided that, you know, it's all or nothing now. We've got to go for to stop communism. If we don't stop it in Vietnam, it's going to take over in Cambodia and Laos and Thailand and move over into the Philippines and then it will be into North Korea so the whole region could go communist. So they became even more entrenched and more determined. Those on the left saw the war because we'd been in Vietnam since 1945 so over 20 years 24 years as a losing cause that it was our involvement was driving nationalists into the arms of the communists. And we could never win in Vietnam. And so, right after the Tet Offensive, we, fought our, we clawed our way back and destroyed the VC and destroyed the, the Vietnamese, but it didn't matter. Right after that, at the end of March, Johnson... Um, announces that he's not going to run again for president. He's only going to serve out his end of his term until January of 1969. Five days later, Martin Luther King is assassinated. Martin Luther King, as we went over in the other videos, was coming out against the war in Vietnam because he saw it as a civil rights issue. Blacks were overly representative in the, in, in the draft and being fought... Uh, part of the fighting force in Vietnam, even though they represent only 10% of the population, they represented over 30% of the soldiers in Vietnam. So, the anti-communist uh, establishment, the right-wing establishment in the government, FBI, military, secret service, and even the racists, and, you know, the mafia, decided to get rid of MLK. And then two months later, the same thing happens to RFK. Now, I didn't mention about RFK, the mob. The mob was in a, a lot of fear about what a Robert Kennedy presidency would do to them. Now, they had already put away Hoffa into prison, okay? And Robert Kennedy had gone after them with a pickaxe when he was attorney general. So they were in great fear of what was happening, and they were looking for allies within the right-wing establishment, and they found it. And again, the track that Sirhan Sirhan worked at, the race track, was owned by the mob. I believe it was Roselli or something like that. We'll find out more about that later. But there was a lot of anxiety within the mob about what a... so. Just to summarize, there was a lot of anxiety in the mob about what a Robert Kennedy presidency would mean to them. There was a lot of anxiety in the military about what Robert Kennedy would do in Vietnam. He would get out before and abandon Vietnam before they had a chance to close the victory against the communists. The CIA was worried about what a Robert Kennedy presidency would do and reduce their operations against the Soviet Union. The FBI was worried about what a Robert Kennedy presidency would, would do. Hoover had gone way past his mandatory retirement age, and Hoover was worried that Robert Kennedy would replace him and put someone more favorable to him in the in the FBI. And then the Klan and Southerners were worried about what Robert Kennedy would do and, you know, pushing more civil rights, pushing for more desegregation, and going after the Klan and going after the racist. So all these groups... I guess you could say the five hand, five fingers on the hand, 
closed ranks and created a fist to wipe out the opposition. Okay? So they knocked off MLK. They eliminated RFK. And those are the two big guys. You know, it's like a prison yard. When you get into a prison and you take on the biggest, baddest dude there and you beat his ass, no one else in the prison is going to come after you. Okay? So that's what they're doing here. Anyway, so we're going to keep reading up uh, on this. I'm going to move on to the next section. This is an interesting article by the, by the Journal of Neurosurgery, and it talks about the uh, injuries sustained by um, Kennedy. And we're going to get into this. And All right. So it says, on June 5th, 1968, having won the Democratic presidential primary, in California, Robert Kennedy delivered a victory speech to supporters at the Ambassador Hotel in downtown Los Angeles just after 12.15 a.m. Pacific Daylight Savings Time. A lone assassin shot Kennedy three times at point-blank range. One of the bullets struck Kennedy in the right posterior arcular region. That's the back right of his head. Within the ensuing 26 hours... Kennedy was transported to two hospitals, underwent emergency surgery, and eventually died of severe brain injury. Although his story has been repeated in the press and recounted in numerous books, this is the first analysis of the senator's injuries and subsequent surgical care to be reported in the medical literature. The authors review eyewitness reports on the mechanisms of injury the care rendered for three hours prior to the emergency uh, craniotomy, the clinical course, and ultimately the autopsy. All right. Hold on one second. Oh, and I did want to mention something about assassinations and especially assassinations committed by or led by the CIA or other intelligence groups like the KGB, like um, anyone, okay? The main thing in assassinations is deniability, okay? You don't ever want the assassination to come back to its source. So if the CIA or the KGB uh, or the SF, SFR, SVR commits an assassination the last thing they want is for that assassination to come back to their source. Okay? Because that would shut down the whole organization. So, what they do is they use you know, uh, outside sources, contract personnel, and they cover it up, the connections, where sometimes even the person that's two or three positions back from the assassin doesn't realize or doesn't know the true source of the funds and the knowledge and the assassination is coming from. So Sirhan would have no knowledge that he would work he was working for the CIA or working for some rogue element group of the CIA. And it's the same on the other end of the organization the main organization that that faction comes from would have no idea that assassination was brewing or coming from their organization. So again, like David Atlee Phillips using the CIA mechanisms and their facilities to facilitate the assassination of JFK, the CIA had no idea it was being used by right-wing elements in its own organization. And, of course, this fulfills two things. It ensures that they can't trace it to who actually committed the, the murder. And then it also ensures that the host organization will do everything in its possible to cover up any links to that organization for fear of that organization being destroyed. 
So I'll give an example. Um, the CIA and the SVR basically use the same, the, the KGB, I guess you could say, use the same techniques. They follow the same rule books and handbooks, okay, because they're basically just the same of this, you know, different sides of the same coin. They're working for different goals, different countries, but they're using the same techniques and the same type of skills. So we just had this, uh, the head of Wagner, Prozigan, he was just assassinated. Okay, he went up, led this rebellion against uh, Putin in the Ukrainian war, and he was a close friend of Putin. Well, Putin never forgives and never forgets. So that's why you see they offered him a way out, go to Belarus, stay there in exile. And that's what he did. But as soon as he moved back into Moscow, like, oh, uh, it's okay, everything's forgiven, okay? They shot down, well, they eliminated him by crashing his plane and killing 10 other people with him. And, of course, none of this links back to uh, Putin or the KGB. And they'll probably blame it on some mechanic somewhere or something like that. The great thing about the great thing about plane crashes is you don't have to set up a patsy, okay? The CIA, or rogue, I should say rogue elements of the CIA, FBI, and all this, they set up rogue, they set up uh, patsies to kill JFK, they set up patsies to kill MLK, and in this case they set up Sirhan Sirhan, supposedly to kill RFK. But we're going to read here the medical information will show you and prove, although they're going to gloss over it, because this is an established medical journal, not a conspiracy medical journal, that we're going to see in this excerpt that we're reading, there's no way in hell that Sirhan Sirhan could have shot Kennedy from five feet away in front of him and shoot him in the back of the head on the right back side. Anyway, we'll keep going. So it says, in June 1968, the United States presidential campaign was in full swing. The leading Republican candidate Richard Nixon was a challenge for the nomination by three Republican governors, George Romney of Michigan. That was Mitch, Mitch Romney's father, Nelson Rockefeller of uh, New York, Ronald Reagan of California. Nixon eventually won the Republican Party nomination. Uh, after President Lyndon Baines Johnson announced that he would not run for re-election on March 31st, just four days before MLK is assassinated, okay, Senators Robert Kennedy of New York and Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota became the leading Democratic candidates in states holding presidential primaries. Um, Hubert Humphrey, the Democratic incumbent vice president, campaigned mostly in states that did not hold primaries. Coming into the California primary, the uh, Kennedy campaign felt that a win was essential for their candidate to keep up with McCarthy and move into the August 26th Democratic National Convention with a chance to beat Humphrey, who was a leading uh, in committed delegates. Now, the whole nomination process is completely different nowadays, but basically... The reason why RFK was going after California is because they held the most seats of any state besides New York. And he already had New York because he was a senator from New York. So if he secured those two and a few other states, his basically getting the nomination was guaranteed. So this is why they had to eliminate Kennedy on that night. Because if he won the nomination which most likely he was going to win the nomination. They knew they had a problem. They knew that he was guaranteed to win the Democratic nomination in August. 
and then most likely going up against another, you know, Nixon, another Kennedy going up against Nixon would be tight and close, but he would probably beat Nixon, you know, like his brother did. So that's why they had to eliminate him. All right. So it says the assassination. Upon winning the California presidential primary, Senator Kennedy addressed his supporters just after midnight on the morning of June 5th in the Ambassador Ballroom of the Ambassador Hotel in the Wilshire District of downtown Los Angeles. In 1968, Secret Service personnel were not routinely deployed to protect presidential candidates. However, Kennedy did have a small security detail headed by a former Federal Bureau of Investigation agent, William Berry. Other members of the security team included former National Football League lineman Rosie Greer and former Olympic gold medalist Rafer Johnson. Um, af after Kennedy, Robert Kennedy spoke, the plan was for the candidate to walk through the hotel kitchen to the colonial room where members of the press were waiting, um, let's see, just after 1215. While walking through the crowded kitchen, Kennedy paused to turn to his left hand side to shake a bus hand of a busboy. So this shows you that the, the conspirators knew his they knew his route. Okay. Because only he only his route was known to his campaign staff. So either someone in his staff was in on the conspiracy or they were spying on members of his staff or they could just simply tap his phones, tap his radios, things like that. So they would know that he would be going through there and have a press conference or it could have been someone in the press that tipped them off also. Okay, It wouldn't be the first time that members of the press were involved with the CIA. All right, hold on one second. Got, got some kind of problem with my mouse here. California primary last night had just completed making his victory speech in the ballroom of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. He then started to move out to, uh, to return to his suite when he was shot. Let's pick it up now. We'll review it with the closing portion of the Senator's victory statement. So I, so I, thank, I thank all of you who made this possible this evening all of the effort that you made and all of the people whose names I haven't mentioned but who made all, did all of the work at the precinct level, who got out the vote, yeah. who did all of the effort, uh, brought forth all of the effort that's required. I was a campaign manager eight years ago. I know what a difference that kind of an effort and that kind of commitment makes. So I thank all of you. The old of you are here. Mayor, Mayor Yorty has just sent me a message that we've been here too long already. So, uh, my thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Thank you very much. Now that was the last public statement by the senator made as he uh, learned the news of his victory in California. Coming after his defeat in Oregon by Senator McCarthy, it was, of course, a badly needed victory. And the senator had campaigned extensively, very vigorously. He changed his campaign tactics and agreed to a debate with Senator McCarthy that was held last Saturday night in San Francisco. Now he goes out of sight now as he begins to make his way down off that platform and uh, into the kitchen, heading for the kitchen, where, unbeknownst to anybody at this time, the assailant was there, waiting for him. And the crowd begins to break up, the cheers, of course, start. You'll be able to hear that first shot in just a moment. As you will see, very few people had any understanding of what it meant. That was the first shot. The crowd continues to move away. Heading for the doors there of the ballroom.
This was at 12.15 Pacific time, 3.15 on the East Coast. As the first screens, somebody has realized what has taken place. Listen for the other shots. Watch this, this young girl put her hand to her face. See the fantastic bewilderment. People jostling, trying to get up, get a look at this point. As our cameras are focused here on the the ballroom, the senator was on the floor in the kitchen. And his assailant already had been seized. The pistol had been wrested from him but not, of course, before all eight rounds had been fired. The word had now, terrifying word, had spread through the, the ballroom. People knew that something terrible had happened, but there was still great confusion. Our associate director, Bill Weisel, who has now emerged from surgery, was also wounded in the abdomen. He's all right. There were several other persons injured, uh, but none seriously. Well, that was the scene, the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles at uh, 12.15 or so, Los Angeles time, 3.15 here in the east coast of the country, as uh, this unknown assailant, this man who has still not been publicly identified, even if his identity is known to the authorities, uh, was waiting there in the, in the kitchen for the, the senator to make his way out. Somebody has to investigate whether he had any information that that is the way the senator would uh, exit the, the ballroom. Let's have another look at this man who, according to the Los Angeles police, is John Doe. He's been charged, uh, but his true identity is not yet known. All right, there you are. So that's Sirhan Sirhan. Sirhan was a, uh, he was a Palestinian, even though he had a Jordanian passport. He was born in, um, you know, I can't remember. I believe it was after the, the War of Independence, like 1948. So he was born in an area of the West Bank that was controlled by the government of Jordan because Jordan had annexed the West Bank um, up into... They controlled it up to like 1967 when the Israelis took over. So he had a Jordanian passport, never became an American citizen. Um how someone could I guess the gun laws were a lot lot more open back then but how someone, a foreign national could buy a weapon I, I don't understand but um, anyway so there's a lot of very strange stories just almost it's almost like like Oswald again where people see Sirhan at gun ranges they see him purchasing um, ammunition with other individuals, okay? And it, it's like they're copying Sirhan or something like that. And it's a very, very strange situation with Sirhan. But anyway, so we're going to move on to the next section, which is these Mary, Mary Farrell documents that we've come across. Now, this is the request to the Los Angeles Grand Jury. Now, 
you know, grand jury basically anybody who's been arrested, uh, the prosecutor has to present his case or portions of his case or the meat of his case to a grand jury. I believe it's like 18 people, depending on the district. And then from that, they can ask questions, they can bring witnesses, they can listen to witnesses. And then from that presentation by the prosecutor, it's up to the grand jury to decide whether they're going to indict the guy. It's not up to the prosecutor or a judge. It's up to the grand jury. And so this is what the grand jury went through. Again, I'm not exactly sure if um, if Sirhan Sirhan actually was convicted or um, plea bargained or something like that. Anyway, so we're going to read through this for a couple of minutes and um, see what we can glean from it. So it says, FBI Assistant Director William Sullivan has doubts about the investigation of the Robert Kennedy case. He stated, there are so many holes in the case, we never could account for Sirhan's presence in the kitchen of the Ambassador Hotel. Did he know Kennedy would be walking through? Intelligence work is exasperating. You can work on a case for years and still not know the real answers. There are so many unknowns investigating Sirhan was a frustrating job for the end we never we were never sure now again this is another indication that there was someone on the inside okay because in Sirhan's case only the news media and uh, members of his security staff Robert Kennedy's security staff knew they were going to go to the um, ambassador hotel kitchen okay the pantry and go out another back way to meet the news media I think they were, have to, they were going to go downstairs to meet the news media there that way and have like a, some kind of press conference in private. Um, you know, you'd think if Sirhan Sirhan was just this individual who didn't have any inside knowledge of, of the, the route of Robert Kennedy, he would be standing in the audience there and would try to shoot him while he was on the podium, okay, or as he was leaving the podium. But no, Sirhan Sirhan is inside the kitchen pantry waiting for him there. So it's like they bring him into this enclosed spot, okay, where he's right in line with Sirhan. And also, one of the persons that was bringing him into this location was the security guard, okay? So it was like, just like in the JFK assassination where JFK is brought into this triangulation kill zone, RFK is brought into this pantry where there's no way for him to escape because of the crowd behind him. And so it's a sure shot that he's going to get killed. And then they've also placed inside the pantry Sirhan Sirhan. Now Sirhan Sirhan doesn't remember how he got into the pantry, he says. He says the last thing he remembers, he was looking for coffee and he saw this shiny coffee pot, and that's the last thing he remembers, besides the girl in the, the polka dotted dress standing beside the coffee pot. So it's very hard to find any kind of video or, video or audio of him talking about that, where he, he noticed this girl standing beside the coffee, the shiny coffee pot in a polka dotted dress, and then that's the last thing he remembers. So it's almost like this girl was trained in hypnotism or something. And, you know, the shiny coffee pot. I mean, how many times have we seen those movies where they, they take that watch, that shiny watch, and they swing it back and forth in front of a subject, and then boom, the person's out, and they're hypnotized. Now, I personally am a big critic of hypnotism. I've never been hypnotized. I, I find it hard to believe that someone could just stop having any control over their mind and be induced to do certain things. But, you know, there are some people, whether they're hypnotized or not, I don't know, that all of a sudden they're acting one way 
and then they're a completely different person. It's like someone turned on a switch and they're a completely different person. Now it could be they have a schizophrenic psychological personality. They have, may have some kind of brain damage or something. But even in that, you know, Sirhan Sirhan had a brain injury which would make him much more susceptible to some kind of hypnotism or something like that. Now, my only experience with hypnotism was when I was in college and, you know, every week they had like people that would make the college circuit, okay, usually like on a Friday or a Thursday or something like that night. They'd have a comedian, a magician, a band show up and play. And it was called the College Circuit. A lot of these bands like the Georgia Satellites and the B-52s, they would travel around the College Circuit going from campus to campus. And that's how they made their money. Well, this guy, he showed up. He was a, a hypnotist. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. I've never seen that before. And he gets up there. And he just starts talking to people in the audience. Okay, you come up here, you come up here. And he had like a row of five seats and had him sit in the seats. And and he went by with a little shiny object in front of their eyes, in front of them. You're getting sleepy. Now, you know, you're going to end at the count of, I'm going to count to five backwards. Or he'd have them count uh, from five to one backwards, you know five, four, three, two, one, and then snap his fingers, and then boom, they'd be out. And then he'd have them do stuff, you know. He had this one guy, okay, now you're a chicken. I want you to walk around the stage and act like a chicken. And the guy got up, and he was like that, on the stage, acting like a chicken. Another guy was acting like he was flying an airplane. Now, another guy, I knew he was in my dorm, okay. I didn't know him well. I wasn't his friends with him, but I... I talked to him a couple times in my dorm and they had him acting he had him acting like a dog on all fours growling and chewing on a bone and I just okay this has got to be a joke they've he's come up before the show started offered these guys 10 bucks to perform on stage and you know they get their 10 bucks and get to act like they're hypnotized, right? Well, after the show, I walk up to this guy who had been acting like the dog and barking and growling, and he had like what was like a bone. He pretended like it was a bone, and the guy kept trying to take the bone, and he would growl and rrr, 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 like that, you know? And I said, so how much did that guy pay you to act like a dog like you're hypnotized? And he goes, what are you talking about? Because you were on the stage on all fours acting like a dog, growling and barking, and you had like an imaginary bone you were chewing on. He goes, no, I wasn't. And I go, yes, you were. That, I, you know, if I had a camera, I, I would have taken a picture. But no, I remember you were right there on the stage with all the, they had another guy acting like a chicken, and you were acting like a dog, and the other lady was, guy was driving a car or flying an airplane or something like that. And he goes, no, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And then another guy I was with, he came up to me and goes, no, no, yeah, you were. You were acting like a dog. You don't remember that? And he goes, no, I wasn't acting. I was sitting in the audience with you. And we, we all looked at each other. like, And then I'm looking at him like, is he just fucking with us? Was he told to talk like that? Or his five, you know, ten bucks, whatever he got? And so I never knew exactly if the guy was, you know, paid to act like that or if he was really hypnotized. Who knows? I don't know. There was another interesting, it was, um, what do you call it? Um, it was a TV show, Starsky and Hutch. And in the TV show, this guy... Um, assassinate someone. He's an assassin. This comes out like 1975 or so. And then he's caught and um, he doesn't remember doing it. And Starsky and Hutch, they start to believe him that he doesn't remember assassinating the guy. And 
then they help him investigate and it eventually comes out that this other group he had gone in for some kind of again it was some kind of car wreck with some kind of head injury and they had used him and hypnotized him okay and implanted this whole assassination scheme and set up the gun and everything and the route where he would take the fall for the assassination actually he never shot the guy it was someone else who shot him and they left him as the patsy you know holding the rifle and the police you know they get him and stuff and it was very interesting so they were trying to harking back to the JFK assassination RFK and MOK and so I found that really really interesting um, but again there's not a lot of whatever there's not a lot of details on that but anyway so I blew through my time on this let me just read real quick so even the FBI is finding they can't figure out how Sirhan knew that RFK was going to be passing through there so that was a big question for them because the FBI likes evidence they like to you know tie up things and they had a really really big problem trying to figure that out anyway so we're going to move on to the last section all right so it says uh, hold on one second so this is from June 5th um, it says crowd outside hospital while RFK um, undergoes surgery it says about 300 persons crowded the entrance to the Good Samaritan Hospital today while Senator Robert Kennedy underwent surgery. Astronaut John Glenn, who had been accompanying Kennedy on his campaign trips, left the hospital shortly after dawn. He looked grim. The senator's brother, Senator Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts, hurried to the hospital after being flown to Los Angeles in an Air Force jet from elsewhere in California. Singer Andy Williams and his actress wife, uh, dancer wife, Claudine Laguette, close friends of the Kennedys arrived at the hospital. Uh, they were not to talk to newsmen. Oh, well, that was pretty short. All right, hold on one second. All right, so this is a good book. Came out about, uh, what, 93 or so? 91, 93? Uh, called Robert Kennedy Assassination New Revelations on the Conspiracy and Cover-Up by Philip Mellison. And we'll just read through this from the beginning to the end. Is there a date on this? Yeah, 1991-94. So when you see two dates like that, that means that was the first edition and then he found new information, he added it, so he, they came out with the second edition um, in 1994. And there is the... So this is a forward by Anthony Summers. Now, Anthony Summers was a British guy, very good journalist. The only problem, and he, he did a lot of good stuff about the RFK... JFK, MLK, assassinations, and uh, the only problem about the credibility of Anthony Summers is that soon after this, maybe within a couple of years, I don't know exactly the date, Anthony Summers commits suicide. He's doing some kind of investigation about INSLAW, which is this software program. Um, that involved the Justice Department and this company it was a spying software and for some reason Anthony Summers winds up dead um, in his bathtub which is very strange another criti uh, criticism I have of Anthony Summers is he doesn't really he really poo-poo's uh, Garrison's investigation into the uh, JFK assassination. Now it's easy to poo-poo something that 
didn't exactly go the way we all wanted it to, but, you know, then Anthony Summers commits suicide, you know, for no reason apparently, just because he was depressed or something. But anyway, so this is his Ford. He said, you would be very angry, a veteran congressional investigator has said, if someone with a gun stopped you from going into the voting booth and took away your freedom to choose, I think um, I think you should get very angry about that. If not, you might as well let go of your individual freedom. That's right. It will be gone soon enough anyway. The reference was to the assassination of President Kennedy. Robert F. Kennedy, his younger brother, was cut down at the age of 42. Um, minutes after winning the California primary, his springboard to the Democratic nomination for the presidential contest of 1968. After the shambles of the Chicago Convention that year, Hubert Humphrey, with neither Robert Kennedy's charisma nor his appeal to younger people and minorities, lost only narrowly to Richard Nixon. So, I wanted to say something about that also. That Richard Nixon has always been and will, was always a CIA right-wing conservative military anti-communist establishment type of guy. He was a guy that they could control. Okay? He wasn't a leader. He was a follower. Okay? They gave him marching orders. He did his thing. One of the things about all the secret anti-Cuban operations, that was all under the control of Vice President Richard Nixon during the Eisenhower years because they knew they couldn't control Eisenhower, but they could definitely control Richard Nixon. That's why they ran Nixon in 1960, and a lot of right-wingers were really pissed off that Kennedy won. Okay, And then Richard Nixon ran again in 1968 because he basically he took the mob money, he agreed to go along with whatever the CIA wanted to do. You notice there's no condemnation, there's no investigation as long of the CIA as long as Richard Nixon was president. Okay? And the whole thing with the Watergate basically started because of the Vietnam War and the release of the, um, the Pentagon Papers. And he was his goal to silence the news media and anybody who had critics about the Vietnam War. Anyway, keep going. He had Senator Robert Kennedy, had Senator Robert Kennedy not been shot, he would likely have won the presidency. The bullets fired in the Los Angeles hotel kitchen prevented us from finding out what he could have done and it, it and how it might have changed the course of history. Also, let's think about that. So, if Kennedy had a won in November of 1968, he would have been president from January of 1969, at least for four years, probably another four years. So that would have put him up to January of 1977. Okay? Then, we've got Ted Kennedy waiting in the wings, but then... Shortly after this, Chappaquiddick occurs, and that destroys any chances of Ted Kennedy becoming president. But Richard Nixon was obsessed with Ted Kennedy and the other Kennedys and was worried about them challenging him in 1972. So you would have had Ted Kennedy as president in 1977, that would have put him up to 1981 plus another four years, up to 1985. By then, there would have been a younger Kennedy, most likely, and then he would have been probably taking the reins. Now, I'm not saying that JF, you know, John Kennedy Jr.'s plane crash in 1999 was... CIA involved or this right wing organization involved in killing him but they'd have a really damn good reason to do that in 1999 
because he probably would have ran for president in 2000. Anyway, all right, we'll keep going. The very fact of Robert Kennedy's assassination should make American citizens, including Williams not born when he was murdered, very angry indeed. After getting angry, they should be demand answers to a host of important questions. Answers long withheld from the American people. Why? Because justice faltered and because misguided officialdom has been obsessed with covering up cover ups and secret secrecy. Americans should be angry all over again when they discover that those who supposed to be their own safety valve, the nation's reporters and academics have failed to effectively press for answers. There are many thousands of journalists, full time historians and political scientists in the United States with shame uh, for my profession from I am myself for, oh, for my I am myself a journalist I must remind us all that no major newspaper or broadcast outlet not one has worked consistently to throw light on the assassinations that they blighted over time in the academic field professor Philip Melanson stands virtually alone. Assassinations, unfortunately, um, is thematic to our time. It is not seriously probed in our newsrooms, nor is it accepted as the subject of mainstream scholarship in our universities. Ponder that fact, meanwhile. Be glad in there that there is at least this sturdy author. He has given the public important books on the murders of Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, and now Robert. His work is scholarly yet highly readable. More than anything, it is about the denial of democracy to a people whose leaders endlessly speak as though America was some paragon of democratic perfection, a proud beacon for less fortunate world. The light of a beacon can flicker, and if it can flicker, it can be extinguished altogether. That is why this book matters. Oh, he's Irish. He's from Ireland. 1991. Anthony Summers. So, I would submit to you that especially back in the days after World War II and especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis, that there has been a group of like-minded anti-communists, fervently anti-communists, right-wing conservatives in the Democratic and Republican parties, but mostly now in the Republican Party, that have sought to maintain power, maintain the dominance of America in the world, regardless of the circumstances, how it's maintained, whether we bomb the shit out of God knows how many people and kill God knows how many people whatever it takes to maintain that dominance this group of like-minded individuals right-wing virulent anti-communist um, conservatives a lot of southerners okay from the southern states Texas Georgia Florida Virginia but also other states like California, New York, have a loose alliance to maintain that power and to take on and take out anybody who threatens that power. And this right-wing rogue group exists within the CIA, the FBI, the military, the Secret Service, the IRS, um, the NSA, almost every government organization that's out there has these groups that are dominant in controlling those organizations. I mean, think about it. When you think about the CIA and the FBI, you don't think about a bastion of hippies and liberals, okay? <laughs> you think about ultra-conservative, right-wing Republicans, okay? At least nowadays. So this group and then their children continue 
that tradition. Because like I said, we're all products of our parents. You know, our parents pass on our their habits and traditions, for good or bad, to their children. And their children carry on those things, just like, you know, Robert Kennedy Sr. and his children, John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, and then their children, John F. Kennedy Jr., Robert Kennedy Jr., although he seems to be going kind of right-wing rogue now. But these traditions carry on all the way up to this day. And we see that just turn on the TV now. The same group of people, I mean, Mitt Romney ran as a Republican. His father was running as a Republican against, you know, Nixon. So these generational groups are trying to maintain power and maintain dominance of the United States at all costs. At all costs. Now they're, maybe the tactics have changed a little bit. Maybe they're not going out and assassinating people as often as they did. But a lot of people end up taking sleeping pills, jumping off buildings, committing suicide, shooting themselves in the back of the head, or getting caught with a 12-year-old girl in a hotel room or pictures on a laptop that just completely destroy their career. These are all, I'm not saying all of them, because, you know, some people have bad habits and they destroy themselves, but also some people have bad habits that other people, their enemies are aware of and use those bad habits to help destroy them. So it continues today. It's not as open. It's not as in your face because they were desperate back then. Now they're not as desperate because they know what they did worked. All right, so we'll continue with this. Again, I'm going to continue with the JFK assassination, the Martin Luther King assassination, the RFK assassination. I'm not going to get into Chappaquiddick right now or Watergate, but maybe eventually I will. And we'll keep going and learning. I think I may do this a little differently where I'll just read a section until or a chapter or a whole video instead of hopscotching from one thing to the next. It doesn't seem to work as well. All right, take care. See you next time.